All right, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vikram. I'm going to talk to you guys about a lot of things, actually. Uh, well, primarily, uh, I want to thank John and Jeff. John just left and Jeff was outside uh, for having me here. Uh, it's actually great. Conferences make me excited because there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, towards, especially towards tracks that are radical. And uh, the way I understand this uh, wrecking ball track, now here we have. <laughs> and so the, the Wrecking Ball track is, you know, is meant to generate a lot of enthusiasm uh, uh, into the radical side of computer security. Uh, that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. I'm a former kernel, kernel hacker. I maintain the uh, C governor states for suspended resume on Dell EX, XPS laptops. Um, I left because they removed the my chunk of code, so they had no need for me. I was a volunteer anyway. Generally, people who do this kind of stuff are hired by Intel. Who knows what? Um, I got interested in security, um, had a job, worked as a network security architect. Did a lot of stuff, you know the usual um, stuff, but uh, that stuff doesn't, is not, is not uh, too, too much the main focus of the talk today. Uh, what can you and what can you not expect from the talk? This talk will not be on how to use a software. It won't be on how to hack and how to break into places. This talk, I'm going to keep a lot of things generalized. Uh, I probably wouldn't move as, as much either as our honorable uh, keynote speaker did, maybe a little bit, but I'll try to keep up his energy and pace. Um, I, today I want to talk a lot about Crossroads. I stand at, at, a, at a very interesting position where uh, my training is an undergraduate. I'm an undergraduate student right now. Uh, I study computational biology. Um, and before, as I mentioned, my job and so on, um, they put me in an interesting position where I can talk about both of them, at least with some confidence. Uh, my main focus today will be to inspire uh, people here, the, the young folks who are either in the industry or, or hoping to get in, to uh, to take take what's, what says a very old old field, you know, biology is well established for who knows how long. Um, and if you can get inspired by some things that happen in biology and how do they apply to, to um, really the, the core of computer security. To me, computer security is an art because there are people who clearly do it better than others uh, and there are those who don't, but they learn, like Sony. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so the, the focus of my talk and the, the way the talk is organized, so you can see, I start with uh, a general overview of security systems. You know, this thing that everyone in this room knows. Uh, then I start to talk about the things that you guys may not know as well, uh, which is life systems. Uh, Stuxnet, one of my personal favorites, and by far one of the most important models that I think, personally, uh, that corresponds to life systems in a computer wires. Uh, Stephen Hawkins is known to say that uh, it's interesting that our first creation, which is, you know, he thinks wires is our own, own creation, and I agree with him to some extent. Are, uh, are an incredibly destructive force that only cause damage. If they're created in our image, supposedly how we are created in God's image, only thing we do is destroy, it, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, after that, uh, I'm going to talk about what is it, what are some of the factors that you can, you can inspire from, from where I stand, and where, what, what can you guys take out of this talk? And uh, lastly, network resilience and, and evolution, which is a, obviously a very common uh, thing for any security network, right? You want, you want the network, network to be resilient. You want it to be powerful enough to respond to adapting threats. Adaptation is actually an interesting, interesting thing. And at the end, I hope maybe when I have 10, 15 minutes or something, uh, we can have a, have a, have a chat. Uh, I like chats, and so they're, they're good. Uh, so let's move on. Okay. Oh, use the mic? Yeah, you can. I think I'll go without the mic. Y'all can hear me in the back, right? Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, what are def defensible uh, strategies? Defensible systems, it, it's a common, a big word and term used in business management where they, they say that you lower your risk, right? Ob obviously, everyone wants to lower the risk and, um, and maximize the, the good stuff that you do. Uh, defensible systems are systems you can secure using your tools if they're, if they're orchestrated in a, in a methodology that allows you to do what's called minimum, uh, minimum repair threshold. Repair threshold is something, I'm defining a lot of new terms, some of them you're familiar with, some you're not. I hope we stay on the same page after I define them. Repair threshold is, is something if I find a vulnerability that's reported, I can patch it really quick. If I can patch it fairly quick, that, that system, that whatever component of my network remains and stays in my repair threshold. Um, this term I might use a lot after, uh, afterwards, but generally, of course, we want to lower the uh, the risk that we, we attain. Every security architect wants to do that. 
Uh, so how, how, do we, how do we do some of these things? And uh, the flowchart I created, everyone's very familiar with it. You protect by making a defensible network. The defensible network has all sorts of things. Um, our, our keynote speaker mentioned some of the tools we use, you know, IDS and so on. Um, and then, and that's, you know, part of our defensible architecture. Pervasive network awareness. This is, do you know what the hell is going on in your network? And you should. If you don't, then, well, uh, you know, that raises other issues. Uh, then, then after that is, uh, is by far, I think, one of the most important parts of this, and the part that most people fail at, is network security <coughs> monitoring. This is why I got a job. The people should keep failing at this. So I have you know, people like me keep getting jobs. If people stop failing at those, that's bad, because less jobs and stuff. Uh, response, so what happens when a breach does happen? Uh, you have a certain set of protocols. You comply to those protocols. It's nice because you have something to fall back on to. And using that, you can go on and, and do uh, even, uh, you know, contain the breach faster, analyze what happened, fix it, report, and you're back on track to, you know, to doing the good stuff again. Um, that, that is all the network incident response. And the last part, uh, well, actually, which should be the first part, I think, uh, is the planning, right? No one plans, I, I think, uh, to do a lot of these things. No one plans to get hacked. Uh, everyone, you know, a lot of people in their mindset think that they're secure. Uh, and soon I'll mention some books uh, by Richard Belzik, and, and they, he talks about how when he started going into the, uh, the Navy, he was working in the Navy intelligence, they thought they were the most secure people. Turns out they were, were so full barred that it was not even funny, you know. Uh, they realized soon afterwards that they were, were overconfident in what they do. And I think a lot of the industry today actually has that same mindset. I think we should get out of that, and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about these uh, upcoming. Uh, so okay, here is, uh, again, uh, just a review of, 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 uh, of securing systems and security systems. Very, very uh, mundane and common, uh, I'm sure, in most of your jobs that you, you take on. You know, data access, you, you want to prevent, or remote logins where you have uh, remote access, you want to make sure those are monitored very well. So the, the RDP vulnerability that came out not too long ago in Windows uh, was a huge issue uh, there. Then, you know, local monitoring, obviously you want to monitor your local data. You have some policies and procedures. These are, I think, one of the most important things. If you design them well, you can fall back onto them and, and do a good job at it. Uh, network security itself, you know, again, the biggest part of this diagram. Uh, port limitation, web security, um, detection, and active, you know, firewalls. Again, very standard common systems. I just want to have everyone get a feel of, you know, this is your comfort zone. And when I take you out of the comfort zone, uh, it, I hope the transition goes smoother. That's why I'm presenting some of these, uh, these things here. Okay, yeah, this is one of our favorite DDoS protection systems, which 99% of the times don't work. Uh, really, uh, you know, I've, I've worked, when I worked and, and we realized, you know, uh, companies sell them, half the time they're total crap and they don't work. You know, people buy them because they have these pretty diagrams that go with them. I stole one of these right here. Uh, so so what, what did these do? My job had, had a lot of common things and uh, a lot of this talk I'll try to focus on and try to relate to what a common uh, network security person would do. You know, you, you, you find hacks, you fix them and that, that kind of a thing. I'm not talking about two radical things. Those come later on in the biology section, you'll see. Uh, so, so what do we have here? A very common uh, thing that's happening. You have botnets or bad people, hackers, and you have legitimate clients all accessing the same internet, right, that goes in and out of your uh, private infrastructure. Uh, you go and you go in and you go out, you try to filter that. That um, The blue thing back there uh, is, is that protecting wall. You cross it. If you're good, you're allowed to cross. If you're bad, you're not allowed to cross. Uh, this never works. Dev filtering, this is the second approach. And actually, this is one of the things I'm going to talk a lot about later on. This is where you, this is not the same as what I presented before, because I think there are sort of two uh, DDoS protection techniques. Their filtering actually is a little slower. Uh, well, they're real time, so but they're a little slower comparatively to some of the approaches where they would filter at levels. And these levels are sort of thresholds. So threshold one will rule out 75% of the bad traffic. Threshold two is the other sneaky attacks that rule out maybe five five or 10% more. And these kind of reduce the damage. It's like, you know, your car has the airbags, right? You get into a, uh, God forbid anyone gets into a car accident, you know, your airbags inflate and they protect you. Hopefully this is happening the same thing in layers. Again, I'm talking about a very, very generic DDoS protection system here. This is not specific to a company or any uh, products. Uh, I do want to make a note. I'm not endorsing anyone. Uh, if I talk about software, ignore me. That's why I'm not going to try to mention software names. I don't want to see my, my talk to be seen as, uh, Talking about someone, I will advertise books because I love books and people love books and books love books. So there are two, there are two books here at, uh, that influenced me a lot, uh, both written by the same guy. Uh, amazing, amazing books. I highly recommend uh, any aspiring uh, network security people to read them. The first is uh, here, Exclusion Detection, and the other one is Network Security Monitoring. In both of these, uh, Richard talks about a very uh, innovative approach. 
something that should have been obvious to us, but apparently wasn't, you know, he, he got a book and profits out of it, so that's good for him. Uh, extrusion detection, what does that mean? Uh, extrusion is a very common word. I have a fancy thing up there, and I'll, I use PowerPoints as a guideline, and I'll hopefully talk to you guys looking at you. Um, extrusion means your system's been breached. You try to contain what's happening from then on to go outside. You don't want a compromised system home back to the CNC, request more stuff, uh, and keep requesting more stuff and more and more stuff, and then you're foobarred. Uh, you want to con control that. Uh, that, I think, is actually a very, very impressive uh, strategy and way to go about doing things because, sure, you have everyone has an has a intrusion uh, detection system where you, know, you don't want pe bad people coming in. But what if system's compromised? This goes back to the definition of defensible system. Can you control and contain what happened? If you control and contain your breach, you're already better, doing better than 80 to 90 percent of people. Uh, there's a report that came up, came up by Semantic. I know some of you guys probably don't like Semantic, but uh, Semantic does a good job at writing reports. I, I'll give them that much. Uh, they, so the, the report that came out uh, mentioned a lot of the stuff that uh, they were particularly talking about containing and, um, and correcting the breach. And they mentioned if you can just do these two things right, if you can implement a good extrusion detection system, and Richard talks in, in great amount of detail in his book, How to Do It Right, uh, they use OpenBSD or FreeBSD-based servers. I forget um, one of those. It's been a while since I've read them. But both of them are very fluid approaches, and I think there's a lot of, uh, lot of really good uh, meat on the bone to take out of these books. Extrusion induction is something I'll actually come back to real quick um, later on in my, um, in my, my talk. Uh, in DDoS that I, I mentioned not too long ago, you know, uh, noobs who are like, you know, lead hackers, uh, they, they claim to, to use these tools like uh, Slow Loris, I think, is one of the popular tools uh, that you know newbies get their hands on and then get arrested for it. Uh, it's it's a it's an incredibly stupid tool because you don't know what the limits are. You know, a tool is only as good as its toolmaker. You can do a lot and you can do nothing. Uh, a lot of those 14, 15 year olds unfortunately accomplish nothing. DDoS protection. Your main goal is actually very difficult. In computer in computer science and computation complexity, it's an NP hard problem. Basically, meaning that it can't be solved in real time. The problem is that of can you, given a, t a target A and B, can you distinguish if A is good or B is good? And so, based on that, there's a lot of criteria that you, you use. And these software, you know, basically you write code based on a criteria. You write your criteria determines what's good and bad. And these criteria are, often, are generally determined by a lot of really smart people uh, who come and talk about these criteria, but sometimes these things don't go as planned particularly with DDoS protection systems because they're getting better and better. Um, I'll talk later on about a, another term, adaptive pressure. Adaptive pressure is, is a, a common uh, known term in evolutionary biology where one thing pushes you to get better. It's like you having a coach, you know, a, a mentor, a coach, who pushes you to do better and better. Viruses, the virus makers, the antiviruses have that kind of a relation, where adaptive pressure pushes the virus to get better and better and better, and the virus acts back on the antivirus to get better and better and better. Uh, these don't work in this particular dynamic, but they, roughly they both catch up at, at a given time. Um, so we all know the common uh, data flood types, the uh, you know TCP flushes, UDP, and, and so on. Uh, over there, the interesting graph actually, uh, and this is what I mentioned, I'll come back to um, uh, extrusion detection. You see on the graph, there's, there's height, and, and, uh, and this is uh, what I'll come back to. As the height increases in this graph, the sensitivity of the data increases. Obviously, no one wants to access the very readily available da data. You're not going to hack a website to retrieve its HTML. You can just do it through using your, your Google browser. You want to get uh, more reports on their assets. Finance is actually playing a big role in this. Sometimes uh, attacks happen because they want to sabotage right before the quarter reports come out. Because quarter reports influence how stock market works. And some of these ha hacks, they may or may not have a direct uh, financial motive, but they end up becoming that. I know this happened because a company that I invested in uh, got hacked, their stocks went down right before quarter four. Quarter four sales were great. I lost 20 bucks in that, I don't care. I pulled my money out of them because they're not defensible, I'm not gonna invest. That's how clients see it too. If the company's not good, they're not gonna trust them, they're not gonna invest in them, so on and so forth. Uh, so again, look at the, 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 the colors get intensified. You know, it's like, same way data gets more secure. The more intense and the more uh, secure the data is, the more you have to do to protect it. You know, it's kind of obvious. And extrusion detection plays a role. Uh, you, you can see there's two ways to get to the top. Either you go from the very bottom or you go from the green up. You can either make your system so you can focus all your efforts that you have so much intrusion detection that no, no one gets in, which is obviously a false hope. Someone will get it. Or you can do a, so, a decent job at it and also do a very good job at extrusion detection, where you can control and contain your, your breach 
And now you're getting somewhere. Because now you not only have protection from someone getting in, you also have protection from someone homing back home or control and command server to protect them from doing bad stuff. Bad stuff I mention as in anything bad. Um, one of the, uh, I, in the pictures before you saw, uh, they, uh, <coughs> this is one of my favorite ones, by the way, uh, they, they mentioned uh, botnets and stuff. This is one of the earliest propagation. I was actually in India. Uh, my dad used to work in, in, uh, in IT. He got a call saying that their uh, banks, uh, especially in the local area, got hit by conflict. He used to come in. Saturday morning, he had to come into work. And uh, that was my beginning of security career. I'm like, huh, what is this thing? Let me look it up. There were no reports online. Back then, internet used not, used not used, it wasn't as, as common as it is now. So you actually had to, uh, you had those modems. You had to uh, plug your tel your telephone wire back in the, that's back in the day. This is 1999. Uh, I was young back then. I didn't understand half the stuff I read, but I found this picture. This is actually from that old paper. I was like, this is so cool, but I don't get what the hell's going on here. Generally, those things inspire you to do better things. So now, uh, so far, I've, I've talked about what security systems are and what they're designed. It's roughly a very generalized approach. And now I'm going to take you out of your comfort zone to something that I like. It's easier on me, right? Um, so these are life systems. And what is a life system? A life system is something that has three criteria. Uh, these are heavily debated. I think these criteria fit the purpose of the stock. The first criteria is it should have a sensor. What's a sensor? Some consensus. Well, uh, what's an integrator? Something that takes the output of a sensor and stores it temporarily, generally. And what's an effector? An effector will take the output of the integrator and do something about it. A very simple system is you take Lysol, you put it on you know, your bathroom or whatever, use it. you kill bacteria with it, right? The bacteria died because of a stimulus they couldn't handle. The stimulus was processed, internalized, taken care of, and it activated stuff that shouldn't have been activated in normal things, and well, it killed them. Um, that's a very common, uh, at the bottom you see uh, beautiful pictures, uh, you can't see it to the opening here, but uh, these are uh, life systems that actually light up if you do the right things at the right time. Uh, basically, uh, I'll come to a point later on that viruses I argue that in, in throughout my talk, and I will more, the viruses are very, uh, I'm talking about computer viruses, by the way, not real life viruses, which I'll get to in a bit too. Uh, that's when it gets confusing. Um, viruses are a very, very powerful tool to study life systems. Um, viruses are nothing more than computer programs we've written. But if you look at them in, in a bigger uh, picture, you start to see things that work in a way that you never expected them to be. This is code downloading other code, making sure it's other parts that have spread are well infected, or if they're out of date, they go and get updated. Uh, this topic is very hot topic in, in, in biology. Uh, some examples you see here, this is called bioluminance. Bioluminance, and basically it lights. These lights are happening when one cell responds to the next cell, which tells the next cell to light up, which tells the next cell to light up. These are completely random, by the way. The patterns that form, some of them, um, when I worked in the lab uh, that, that did some of this stuff, absolutely, uh, absolutely breathtaking um, patterns that come out. One of them actually looked like Christmas, Christmas tree around the Christmas center. Like, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, <coughs> I am a huge fan of emergence. I think my formal study uh, as, as an undergraduate started uh, with emergence theory. I focused on emergence because emergence was interesting. The question that drives me, every morning you wake up, you think about, OK, why am I waking up and going to work today? Why am I waking up going to lab today? To me, the, the question is, why is simplicity around? Why are very complex things boiling down to simple facts in nature and in life? And that's a question, it's a very difficult question, obviously. I may not never find an answer. I hope I don't, because it becomes boring afterwards if you have answers. Uh, uh, Stephen Wolfram, uh, if you've used Mathematica before, uh, talked about, the, uh, uh, I wrote a book, A New Kind of Science, uh, influential book, and maybe this thing, actually it's got, 1,500 some pages, ridiculous. He said it took him 10 years to write it. Up there you'll see these patterns started from nothing but random movements of dots. These dots, this is after 10 minutes by the way. Uh, completely random movements, the only things, there are four principles generally. I'm only gonna talk about one or two that they rely to. If you're next to a guy, you push the guy up. If you're behind the guy, you push him back. And if you're up and down, you do something crazy. Uh, but really, these patterns are coming out after 10 minutes. Again, realize computers can do these things much, much faster than we can imagine, right? You do it on paper, it's gonna take forever. This takes 10 minutes. And these are in impressive, interesting colonies that are happening. Um, 
So how does this relate to life systems? Uh, bear with me, I will get into talking about security systems in a very quick moment. And you'll see, I, what I want you guys to focus on throughout my talk is, is how are these things, uh, it, just in the back of here, how are these things related to what you guys work on on a daily basis? Emergence means that more complexity arise, arises from well-defined simple components. These simple components can be programs, program modules. Stuxnet has about 15 modules that just do program management. Uh, detecting on the uh, Siemens uh, systems. Uh, I'll talk about Stuxnet later on in a bit. Uh, that's a very exciting topic. But here, I want to talk about two things. One, obviously, that book, get it. It's good. Uh, just like the last books. Uh, really good book. Uh, it talks about, the, in, in there, they talk about how the lives of software, cities, and ants are related. Uh, sounds like a crazy topic, just like the crazy topic I'm presenting. Uh, but uh, that book inspired me to do a lot. And I think everyone, at least at some level, should understand emergence because you can build better algorithms, you can build better tools to do things, but at a, at a level you realize, I don't need to do better tools. If I can use the tools, this is a Unix, very core Unix philosophy. You use one tool to do one thing. MUT is an email reader, that's it. Procmail is an email filterer, that's it. I have task order, which is the task manager, that's it. You don't make MUT do 20 things that it sucks at all 20 of them. You make it do one thing and it's good at that. When you start stacking them up, you, you sort of break the rules of, you know, <coughs> the rules of statistics where and added complexity should saturate, but they don't. That's what um, Steve Johnson is going to talk about in his book, and, and we see this happening up in life system. If you let this simulation run forever, we don't know what's going to happen, but something will come out of it. Maybe something very intricate and complicated is going to come out of it. And the thing is, if you let simple tools stack up, they will make something complicated, and that is very, very, very powerful. If you really, truly understand what those simple tools are, my God, the thing you're going to get out of it is going to be Truly incredible and very powerful because it's customizable. How many people, just by a show of hands, have used MUT here? I hope everyone. Oh wow, that's uh, that's a few people. Not my expectation, but yeah. So MUT is a you know a very old email client. If you contribute to group lists, mailing lists, and whatever, they prefer you use MUT because Gmail does top hosting, and they don't like that. Um, the bottom picture here actually is one of the things that I, I want to talk about. Very very brief detail. Mitochondria. That's it's a part of the cell. Mitochondria is generally the powerhouse. Um, Back when life didn't exist, mitochondria existed by itself. It got swallowed up by a cell afterwards, somewhere down the line. Something ate it. Uh, when they ate it, it turns out in its tummy, it didn't get digested, but it stayed there. It stayed there because these two could form a symbiotic, uh, a mutually beneficial relationship to each other, and they stayed. That's what mitochondria looked like, by the way. It's a circle. Well, that's the inside. This is what it looks like. And then the, the idea I'm trying to show here is, again, a very simple thing that just generates energy now got, got absorbed by something that only existed as a layer. Before mitochondria and stuff were around, the cells only existed as inanimate layers. These were chemicals, lipids. Once you have a powerhouse, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now we add machinery to replicate, and now we have bases of, of very rudimentary bases of life. You have a powerhouse, and you have replication. Now we're getting somewhere with this. Okay, and this is a picture. Uh, I actually made this. I'm really proud of it. It came out good. Uh, part of it was made in, in, in Mathematica. Uh, so what is going on? The top part, it's kind of fuzzy, but, but the top part is uh, I analyzed uh, the attacks that happen per year. Uh, again, semantic reports list this kind of stuff there. You can just gut it off there. Uh, the number of attacks that happen, the frequency of them, where they're very clustered, that's DDoS attacks. The other ones are all other attempts. Some of these are just failed, failed attempts to log in. Uh, the point I'm trying to show here is that even though these attacks look like nothing in the top shelf, they just mean if you have this kind of stuff, you're doing bad as a company. You shouldn't have this many attacks happen. That's not, you know, obviously that's not good. Um, the point I'm trying to make is, is in the lower part, you see that you can actually stack these up in a 3D structure. And look at that, something, something interesting is coming out of it. Can you make sense of your attacks in a 3D point of view where you saw nothing before, but you start to see some structures? Maybe the top structures in here can be avoided if you do one strategy. You can tackle more than one thing. You can identify problems. <laughs> Again, the idea is emergence. We take simple attacks that we, we recorded, we pile them up in a, in, a, in a logical fashion, and you get something out of it. And, and, and we hope that something you get out of it is interesting enough to help you not be attacked by the same things again. Oftentimes this happens, by the way. You get attacked and you get attacked by the same thing. You realize you just forgot to fix one thing. Uh, that happened to me when I was working. Uh, I got called by my boss and that was not good. But anyway, uh, it, it was good, it came out good. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I left that for soon. So anyway. <laughs> uh, so um, we, I just showed you a picture of these attacks that happened. 
how does that relate to life systems? In life systems, bacteria like to do this thing where they where they, they have a lot of friends, you know. They like to be around their buddies. I like to be around my buddies, you know. Here, you guys want to be around each other, uh, at least those of your friends and stuff. So you want to be around your buddies, and these bacteria form. You can see this picture here. They all go attach. They attach on a surface they find where food is present. They attach and they form these things called biofilms. The picture looks slightly complicated, but basically biofilms are these, you know, it's like your group of friends, right? Someone, uh, someone attacks you, you have 10 buddies. I mean, come on, no one's going to bother attacking you. The nine of them are going to beat the crap out of the people who attack you, right? That's kind of the idea here. You have a lot of them who are protecting you, working together as an entity. Realize bacteria have no consciousness, no mind, none of that stuff. We have that. They don't. Yet, yet they're able to form these, these interesting colonies out of nothing but sharing very fundamental and known compounds to each other. These compounds signal them to do one thing worse than another. That's an interesting approach, right? So in, in, in security systems, we can have something like that happen often. And this is the idea that, that I, I talked about earlier with MUT. Uh, you can put together MUT, you can put together ProfMail, and now you have a decent filtering system for, for email. You can put together other stuff like I put together Task Warrior, so I can schedule tasks right from my email client by pressing M and stuff like that. That's what kind of a, what the idea of, uh, of biofilms is. And the interesting thing here is that biofilms and these kind of things, they produce it, what, what I like to call intelligent response because before, we know bacteria were not intelligent, but now they have a sort of a protection. You know, it's like you're walking with 10 of your buddies and you have a sort of protection by being around them. And kind of the same here, actually. They have protection just by being around their buddies and, 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 and things like that. Uh, and here is actually one of my problems with a lot of software. Softwares will often put things together. They have new and neat features, and they, they take them. And then they take out some of the old stuff. Because if you advertise the old stuff that got you free, you're probably not going to run very well in business. Um, part of that. Um, and so um, life systems have an, have an incredible advantage over this. Uh, I worked in a lab before where, so everyone here, uh, I hope at least to some extent knows what DNA is, right? So it's like a long thing that does other things, you know? That your DNA is like your core uh, molecule for life. So DNA contains everything. Ever since evolution started, it contains everything from the first get-go till now, which is a few million years of evolution that happened throughout that time. DNA contains every single change that, that accumulated, even us. We contain a lot of things that even happened that are, you know, we share most of our stuff with other related species. Um, Turns out, about seven million years ago, there used to be something called the theta defensin, which I show here. It's a protein, by the way. Theta defensin used to protect old world monkeys. This is before our ancestors, direct ancestors, chimpanzees and orangutans formed. These guys had a protein that could protect them from HIV. This is still present in our DNA, but it's not activated, of course. New, my, my point I'm trying to make here is security systems presently often miss out things that they realize afterwards were important. Your, your patches delete code, they, your patches insert things that may or may not be, you know, you want to avoid redundancy, right? Obviously your software needs to be slim and, 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 and nice because it works that way. But that may not be an advantage to it. And over this, biological systems have an incredible advantage because they can save almost all of these things that happen. Uh, the lab I worked in earlier on, they revived theta defense in a seven million years old protein that's sleeping. They revived it, and it had incredible amount of success treating HIV. Now they're working on a drug that I'll actually, uh, it's a very commonly found drug, actually, amino black side. Uh, don't worry if you're not familiar with that. Uh, if you are, talk to me after the conference. Um, the, uh, the, this very uh, common antibiotic is found outside. You, you take that, you apply, you give it to some, some patient, and um, they start to, well, we're not at patient level yet, but this is just at the level of, um, of samples and stuff. So, they had protection for HIV for three or four days. This is three or four days continuous attack by HIV virus to get in, to get in, to get in. No, no, it's like the slapping of the kick. Take away. No, you can't come in. Um, this is, uh, I argue that this is actually one of the advantages. This redundancy and this incredible amount of complexity that life systems possess is an advantage over, over some of the um, uh, security systems, which might or might not we want to we keep implemented. I'll talk about the strategy in the ground where I think. Uh, how about something like torrent trackers, right? So these trackers stay up most of the time and they track you know, who's in and who's out, that kind of general kind of stuff. Can you keep old, your old versions of the software very slimmed down just the module you removed as a tracker? So if you detect an attack like that that you previously tackled, can this tracker take care of it in real time? Or can this tracker at least file an alert? That's the idea. As long as you can be alerted, you, can, you might be able to do something about it. Um, Computer systems also have a, have a major problem, and that's limited adaptability. Um, 
if you take a software, uh, in Linux, you know, softwares generally edit the uh, .rc files and stuff like that. I'm talking about Mutt, you, you only have three or four files you can edit. In there, you have a limited amount of variables you can edit, because obviously the programmer doesn't want you to edit everything, right? Uh, you'll break something. You want to edit the things that, that seem interesting to you. In biological systems, that's not always true. In life systems, that, that thing over there, it looks like a clover leaf. Uh, it's an adapter molecule that's found in all of us, by the way. Uh, uh, the adapter molecule can go on. This thing can do ridiculously impossible tasks that would be would be not um, not known otherwise. In humans, uh, this was there was a case uh, study. This guy was sleeping. There was a tornado. And he's just, he's sleeping, you know, all this and, and napping nicely. The tornado sweeps the entire house, his roof. He flies, I think, a hundred feet from the tornado. It's fallen. He wakes up. He's just fine. Not even a single broken bone. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is, is that the life systems using these adaptive molecules can produce responses. In life systems, it's called the SOS response. Uh, in you know, that kind of uh, SOS is bad, right? So that's help me out. Some kind of stuff. These SOS responses make it so that you can do, I mean, it releases adrenaline, and adrenaline can do incredible tasks. I mean, I'm not going to talk go, go into that uh, in, into detail, but adrenaline is a, is a thing that we are one of the only things, only species who have it, and it's for a good reason. Uh, adrenaline makes us uh, from a normal to a superhuman. <coughs> so I, uh, I hope uh, most people here are familiar with Turing completeness and, and the notion of what Turing completeness. Uh, if you're not, Turing completeness is a language that can give rise to more languages. Uh, roughly, that's one way to put it. Uh, Turing completeness is basically, if you know C, you can create programs out of it. Uh, in the most basic terms, a Turing complete language gives me the ability to create other things out of it that were not originally part of constructing this language. So C has a certain list of words you use. Those are system reserved. I created something out of it that was not that. Hello World was not a part of C. I created that. That gives me the ability to create. That's Turing completeness. Viruses, now I'm talking about software stuff, by the way. Um, viruses are nothing more than Turing completeness codes that somehow we think, I mean, we're seeing them now, and I'll, when I talk about success, this will become very clear. We're seeing them behave just like life systems, if not better. The examples I just gave, the uh, the adapter molecule, the theta defense, uh, I will try to come back to them if we have enough time to revisit them in, in the context of life systems. Um, Complex viruses, and I'm talking about the three big ones that were just revealed not too long ago, uh, Stuxnet, Duke Q, and Flame. Um, I have read almost too much about them because they were amazing, uh, just amazing pieces of, of software. Probably some of the most advanced software, and the people who wrote them were genius mathematicians, or I don't know who they were. Um, no one knows, but anyway. Uh, these complex viruses create sublocal. Local is if I have a computer and this computer and this computer, they're part of a network. Okay, that's cool. But I can also create a peer-to-peer -peer network from this network to another network here. These create these sublocal networks that initially were impossible to do. You know, this sounds just like out of a sci-fi movie, right? You have you have a, a nuclear power plant and you blow it up and, and stuff, bad stuff happens. This is like good guys fighting against a bad guy. This is right, sounds like right out of a movie, but this is almost exactly what Stuxnet did, and I'll talk that, about that in, in much detail. Basically, viruses now are known to have almost all the features that we know exist in life systems. They can replicate, mentioned here, they have self-assembly, meaning they are downloaded in parts, right? So often, a lot of times, viruses download their payload after the fact. They, they, they have self-assembly because they can function as a whole after they download the second part. The first part knows how the second part is going to dock into it and function properly as a full virus. Uh, afterwards, they can also, the most important thing, they can sense and respond. Viruses have, have this thing, if you try to, especially with Stuxnet, if you try to delete it, it'll lock up your system. Uh, and the machines that were used by the Iranian engineers to control the Siemens uh, control systems, uh, the devices, if you try to delete some of the parts of it out, or if you try to release sex and modules or drivers, it will lock up your computer. And it sounds nothing like a, you know, it sounds just like, oh, my computer got broken or something. Uh, I'll go fix it. But they don't realize this is actually a defense by the virus. If you reset it, sex and restores itself from a local command and, con command and control server. Uh, I keep asking sex and, uh, don't worry, I'll get to it. Oh, right here, actually. Oh, there we go. Um, so, sex that, uh, in my opinion, by far one of the most brilliant pieces of code written ever. Uh, this figure explains, I'm going to refer to this figure. Generally, I like to use PowerPoints as guidelines when I talk, because I get to see you guys and you know, your beautiful faces. But uh, this time, I think I'll look back and see. Stuxnet starts from a uh, controller command server. Uh, we have the Siemens report, or sorry, the Stuxnet report uh, by semantics 
benches. The two of the most prominent ones where they got most hits on controlling command centers were actually in Iran and Israel. Uh, realistically speaking, US and Israel probably, none of them made it because they're the only ones who have the capability to make it. No one else can because this is far too complex. By the way, uh, there was a torrent not too long ago. I probably should have downloaded it, but I was younger, I was stupid. The torrent had the code for Stuxnet. I got it down, it's beautiful. I didn't look through all of it. Just some of this stuff, kinda, kinda neat stuff. I think when HP Gary got pwned, they got the stuff from them and uploaded it. And I'm like, well, that's cool. You know, there's a torrent here, I can download it. Uh, so, there's an infection from the control and command server into one target site. Uh, in case of Stuxnet, there was more stuff involved. Someone actually plugged in a USB. This USB, USB contained a, and this is the coolest part of all three of these sister worms. USB container driver that was signed up by Microsoft. No one knows how the hell they got a driver signed. Uh, it was actually signed by Realtek and uh, I think by Microsoft too. Uh, the vulnerability was a printer spool vulnerability. Uh, that printers are bad. Printers are totally evil. Oatmeal wrote a comic on how printers are evil because printers are generally our most insecure things. No one gives a f about updating, you know, printer drivers. But well, someone can exploit them. That's another way you can phone someone by printer stuff if they don't have updated. Uh, we got a new printer, I was surprised. This printer has FTP running on it locally. So you can email or upload files to be printed on that. I'm like, this is too much for a printer. Only thing this thing should do is print my documents and nothing more than that. We don't want 20 other features. So, okay, infection happens, the, guy, the computer's happy, the, the virus is happy, not the computer. Uh, the virus is all happy, like, the virus now goes and searches for other mates that are connected. Related computers that are nearby in its vicinity, it'll go spread to them. Once it spreads, all of them have uh, I think it was 1159 actually at night when these viruses go and check for an update script. They run an update script if the command and control servers are nearby or if they reach the command and control servers, they'll update themselves. So this is something you can absolutely prevent through extreme detection. I guess the Iranians didn't read that book, so you guys should. Um, obviously, after they, they got uh, those viruses get hold and take control over what's going on, uh, the, um, after the control happens, then um, then they go and seek and destroy. Uh, Stuxnet worked beautifully, and this is actually something, uh, I'm almost certain that designers of this took some inspiration from life sciences, because Stuxnet worked by feeding false information. It basically read what the, the uh, valves and the, those rotating chambers were feeding. A few days later on, it basically fed the same information, but caused the cylinders to rotate faster. The cylinders kept on rotating and rotating, but the operator only sees the fake data that Stuxnet generated out of the blue. You don't know what's going on with your machine. No one's gonna go in and check that. But they found over and over again the cylinders were, were, were not working. They were they kept on breaking. Why is that? Uh, is the rotation wrong? No, my data tells me that my, my rotation of cylinders is absolutely fine. They didn't know the system were doing this this ingenious task of uh, and live systems do this by the way. Viruses they go, this is animal viruses by the way, they go into your cell, they infect it, they replicate. The cell doesn't know why it's replicating the virus to make more of it, right? The virus wants more buddies, it's, it's lonely inside of a cell, because, and then it goes into the cell and makes more of itself. It's like, well, let me make more of my buddies. And in the process, the cell actually will do this, and it keep doing this. The problem is, the cell doesn't realize, just like the operator didn't realize the success, success that success was feeding that info. Okay, so there's story time, right? So everyone loves story time, I like story time. So, uh, once upon a time, yes, all stories start, there was a cute virus uh, that was lacking food. Uh, it found food as in terms of a bacteria. You see this guy? That's bacteria. That's how they look, by the way. They look really cool. Uh, neat, they have a tail. This is what's called a T4. Right out of this tail, uh, as much pressure as your tire exploding generates, that's how much pressure this thing's gonna put and inject its DNA. Nothing in the world that it's living can tolerate that much pressure at the level of a cell. It just goes right in, and you can't stop this thing. You can stop its attachment maybe, but you can't stop once it's attached. It's gonna dig its toes in. Those are spikes, toes, whatever you wanna call them. Uh, and then, bam, it injects itself inside. And so now the cell's inside, but it feels lonely. Uh, it's happy, but it's, 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 it's just there by itself. You know, it doesn't have buddies in there. Um, this is how you would feel once your systems have been breached, but you don't know. The viruses, the worms, whatever backdoors injected are present, and now is where the good stuff is gonna start. This virus is gonna go and in, inject itself once more into this, the machinery of the cell and make more of itself. Because you know, it wants buddies. No one, no one wants to be by themselves, right? Uh, this guy wants buddies, and in the process of making new friends, this guy is gonna start destroying stuff the same way in how security systems, once a virus gets in, 
it's going to download more payloads and more of its buddies and actually implement the core modules. Uh, Stuxnet had a core module that <coughs> that actually uh, would start off by resetting your computer. That's how they initially found uh, Stuxnet. The, the computer would go in for that reset loop. Uh, they thought it was a common problem. Symantec had some honeypots that Stuxnet accidentally went to, and that's where the journey started uh, to find the Stuxnet. So here's you know uh, more of story time. That virus makes more mates. It makes those mates. The cell is broken. Uh, it go it leaves, and basically the cell's dead. Uh, they keep repeating this process, it makes more and more of itself, basically the same way Stuxnet keeps on repeating locally to local networks, and viruses repeat themselves locally to local networks. Keep doing more and more of that, you cause more and more harm. Similarly, the operator or the, in, or the cell in a life science model, they don't know what they're doing and why they're doing it. They just know they're doing something, they're replicating. But they're not replicating themselves, they're replicating the virus and making more of that. That stuff happens. Um, Again, back to Stuxnet because I love this thing. Um, uh, they said, uh, Symantec, I think, said that this wires reset Iran's nuclear program, which, by the way, is total shit. Uh, you read how they implemented some of that stuff, and you read some of the people who were involved in it. Basically, a lot of the information that they used to implement a lot of their work in the nuclear power plant was publicly available. They didn't do something with no. A lot of that was papers written up in 1970s and 80s here by scientists who just implemented that stuff. Um, it set their nuclear program back by two, three years, but just by the amount of cylinders and money. Because cylinders cost money, you know. Anything you add the word nuclear on top costs already $5,000. And then you actually, and then that thing actually has real function, that costs another $5,000. And then you replace it, that costs maybe five more. Uh, so Iran obviously shut itself off. No one knows why they just, uh, this, this is after, right after the impact, by the way. Uh, only the IEA. Uh, in the International Energy uh, Atomic Energy Association, they're the only ones who actually know what, what's going on because they were there visiting. They're not allowed to talk because they made a pact with, with the, if, they, if they, they can even come into Iran and talk about their nuclear stuff, they can't talk about it outside. Uh, so Iran just shuts their nuclear facility. Uh, it comes as a shock to the world when uh, Semantic reveals what the hell's actually going on. And they partner up with someone, uh, this German guy, um, I forget his name now, a brilliant fellow. This guy had weird degrees. He had knowledge of some weird stuff. He actually had a really good expertise in those semen devices. That's why he got it, uh, recruited to work on this project. Uh, and that resulted in them finding. Uh, he told me, uh, I actually corresponded with him through email. Uh, he told me that through, through when this was going, I followed this very, very closely when it was happening. He told me he was working 80 hours a week and he didn't feel like he wanted to go to sleep. He would come in because he was so passionate about what he was doing. Because he, you know, he realized that this is something novel that's never happened before. He, he said, I, I, he, you know, he told me this is his coach. He's like, man, I come into work, I go work. I go back home, I sleep, I come back to work. This is my life for five months. And he decoded everything that was happening in, in, uh, in Stuxnet. He gave the largest chunk of information on it. Uh, yeah, so uh, real quick, Stuxnet has modules, as we, as we mentioned. Life science systems also have modules. Viruses have a module that maintains their own integrity. They have a module that makes their friends. They have a module that kills the host after they may make their friends. It's like, you know, you go, you go to someone's house, and like they invite you for dinner. You go there, and then, you know, you call your buddies, hey, there's free food, come by. And then you basically, uh, all 10 of your buddies eat, and all 10 of your buddies actually gang on this poor fellow and kill him. And then the house is yours, all the food is yours. That's how viruses work, more or less. Um, <laughs> And so the, you know, the, the Stuxnet modules work in a similar way. There was a management module, there was a loading module, there was an unloading module, there was an updating module. You can go on and on. There's 27 total modules, I think, in Stuxnet. Last time I read the thing, maybe there's more. Uh, again, get this book too. Uh, so, uh, so Stuxnet and Duke, uh, two of the, uh, the sister rooms that came out, you realize they were actually integrated in a, in a much larger, uh, larger whole as itself. Flame, as I understand, actually contained a whole freaking strip stripping engine based on Lua. It was really stripped down. This thing could actually, this thing was left so that the attacker could <coughs> actually modify and create new worms right on the spot on that server that is affected, the local control and command server, and push them out. It's like, you know, you're pushing your code to GitHub. GitHub. You just, you push, and you just type in push, whatever, and does that. Basically, that was the idea that you create local repositories of these viral infections there. Similarly, in life systems, sometimes viruses do nasty, nasty things. Uh, the uh, Salmonella virus actually has something very similar to this. I feel like, and this is maybe my own personal bias, I feel like a lot of these creators, they drew inspiration from biological systems. Because it's impossible, you know, this is, all this stuff that I'm presenting is something that's very commonly known to someone who works in life sciences. And how, how did they make something so eerily similar to what's found in, in natural systems? 
maybe they took some, some uh, you know, to design some of these best viruses, they took inspiration from those things. Uh, and I hope you guys do too in designing the future uh, security system, uh, inspiration from these uh, particular worms or these particular biological systems. Okay, and here is probably the, the wrecking ball part of this, this track. There's no Nicolas Cage here yet. Um, these pictures look complex, but don't worry about the complexity. I made them so that you guys probably can't read them. That's for our purpose. They, they, the point of these pictures is to illustrate numbers. Uh, and we, we win by numbers. Companies cannot make software that they, they advertise, look, our software is shitty, but we have so much of it that you're protected. That won't sell. Our body works that way. We have, at any given time, 75% of our blood contains these thugs called NK cells. They're like your local thugs that, that will rob you of everything you have. They protect us from something that's not us. So there's self and there's non-self. In the immune system, it's very clear. Immune system is our major integrator. You can see, just count the numbers. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. Each of these can then go on to make 10 to the 8 number of themselves. 10 to the 8 is a huge number. They keep making them. These are modules of life system. Just so I described stuff that has management modules, it has loading, deloading modules. Immune system has these guys, which will pretty much kill everything, actually even including you. That's the, uh, the basis, no, that's really, that's the basis of autoimmune disease, where your, your own, the problem is you have so much of this stuff in, in you at all times that if they decide to attack you, you're dead. I mean, there's no way saving you. Uh, that's called septic shock, happens sometimes. Uh, if you're a good doctor, you can save the person. If you're bad, they die, generally they die, even if you're a good doctor, because the intensity is too high of these things. Uh, uh, unfortunately, no more pictures. I just text stuff because uh, you know we had pictures, pretty pictures and stuff. But now we can talk about some more material. Um, quality versus quantity. Uh, you sell stuff if you have quality, and if you have pretty pictures. I think most of this depends on sales and how well you, you can pitch your product. More importantly, I think a lot of it depends on can you make pretty documents where I stole the pictures from throughout this presentation. If you make them, you sell your stuff very well. Our body doesn't do that. We work in a very sloppy system, but we have 10 to the 20 of them, so we're good. You know, how much of virus can enter your body, right? No matter how much it enters, you always have more of us. And you have so many of them that one of those will actually act on killing. You're always gonna have one, one, that one guy, you know, you have the one guy in class who asks them questions, right? There's always that one guy who will kill any given virus at any time, even HIV. Uh, and once they find that guy, basically, you know, that guy is like your main fighter. Uh, I'm almost done by the way, don't worry. Uh, oh, this is oh, this is a really cool picture actually. A beautiful diagram I stole again. Uh, the, don't worry about the names and stuff. Just look at the locations. These are all your module centers. These are the command and control servers in the human body uh, that do all the neat stuff. Basically, these guys have one function: produce a lot of the stuff that kills other stuff. That's it. They don't do any. They don't do IDS. They don't do any of that detection. You know how detection works in us? Chemical imbalance. You maintain a very proper balance in the body. If the balance is imbalanced, well, we need to do something. These guys all activate and produce a crap lot of stuff that actually harms you. That's so why when you're sick, you actually start to feel, when you recover, it takes a while to recover, not just one day. Uh, it's because your own tissues and, and stuff got damaged from it. Uh, so NK cells, the, 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 one of the things I was talking about earlier on, these guys attack in numbers. It's like, you know, you're, you're walking on your, on down the street, you're wearing a, a golden chain, a, a golden watch, everything like a golden shirt, you know, that's like just asking to get robbed. But uh, you're walking down a shady, shady hall in alleyway. Uh, you come by and you see someone, uh, and then those guys, you know, you're walking with your, your bunch of buddies, right? So you think no one's gonna attack you, but you know, well, you're wrong. You get a whole bunch of people attack you. One of those your buddies runs back to your boss, you know, because you're the thugs, so you have a gang, or however that, that shit works. Um, you go back to your boss, your boss <laughs> comes back and says, you know what, you ran away? You know, I'm gonna send like 50 of my people. That one guy who came by knows, oh, hey, look, that person had a gun, that person had a baseball bat, and that person had, and that person had uh, these other things. And so you basically come back with your buddies, you know, you, uh, everyone has a machine gun or something now, and you kill them all, and you win. That's how uh, generally body systems work out, um, for the most part. Uh, so we have a lot of pwnage advantages that give us, uh, make us who we are, and I, I hope that, um, I'm running a little short on time actually, and I'm gonna to try to wrap up quick here. Uh, I hope that part of what, what, I, what I tried to get across to you guys is, is a lot of these aspirations from biological systems and life sciences, how these things work. The biggest thing that we have going for us is that life has been around for a couple, 2.5 billion years. That's a long time. Security systems have not been around for that long, which is good, uh, because then they will be just as good. Uh, we will, a lot of us probably have jobs because the machines are in everything. Uh, the, 
we have advantages because of random mutations that occur in us. These mutations, so to think of it this way, the, the, the worst thing you can think of, AIDS, right? So um, one of the worst things you can think of, AIDS, 1% of population will never get AIDS, no matter what happens. But you can't infect everyone with AIDS and have 1% live and like, oh, hold up, that's the 1% and you'll kill everyone else. Uh, but at, at any given time, 1% of them have it. So the, the introduction of random logic and, and fuzziness, can you incorporate those things in security systems to make it so that those guys, there are some modules that don't work in your traditional manner. They don't detect the common rules you follow. They detect something else. That goes back to the idea kind of the trackers, right? Each tracker detects or peers and so on and so forth. Can you make it, make them happen so that they work differently in a sense that can confer advantage? How this works, I leave up to you guys because I'm not a security person anymore. I study computational biology. So that's your challenge to figure it out. My challenge here is to present to you guys what can I get across in whatever 45, you know, 50 minutes that was allocated um, to make sure that do you do you do you realize this how much advantages live systems have just by numbers? So writing software that's the most brilliant code may not be the best approach always. Sometimes just putting together a lot of shitty tools might give you uh, a humongous functional advantage over, over some of these tools. And I think I will wrap up by, by, by saying that, by thank you for, keep, for staying awake, actually. I'm surprised. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, maybe I have two, three more minutes. I'm going to open up the forum for questions. Anything? Yeah. No? No questions? We're cool. All right, people. That was lovely. Thank you.